are you talking about? Yeah. I just scheduled this. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Um, uh, you're coming in and uh, uh, on mute and with your screens off. We're going to do uh, a quick kind of presentation and then open it up for Q&A. Um, there's a number of folks here I, I see already from the Redbrook um, fight uh, who I I'd love to have you, you know, kind of raise your hand once we're done if you want to speak and say something. Um, and, and I'm sure there'll be some folks who are pretty active in Bristol Bay. We can we can also have that conversation um, after. So we are recording this session and we're also streaming it live to Facebook. The recording will be on uh, Trout Unlimited's YouTube channel. That's where you'll also find all of the um, Trout Week uh, videos and recordings. Um, you can also go to tu.org slash Trout Week uh, to tune into other stuff happening tonight um, and throughout the, the rest of the week and weekend. Um, it's been a, a pretty awesome week so far and uh, I'm excited to see uh, where we go from here. Um, given the fact that this this uh, topic spans from Massachusetts to Alaska, I'll, I'll give folks a good five or ten minutes to to join in and, and jump in. Um, and uh, before we get formally started, um, but maybe why don't we do introductions while while people are filtering in, and then we can and we can dive in. Awesome, Nell, you want to go first? I can. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Nellie Williams. I am the Alaska director for Trout Unlimited, based in Anchorage on Dena'ina lands. Um, I live here. I've lived in Alaska for, um, boy, uh, 12 years, more than 12 years. And I've worked for Trout Unlimited for close to 15, 14, 14 years. Um, spent some time in Wyoming and really got to know the, the TU family around the country. Um, and all the good work we do, uh, you know, on the local level and in local local rivers and home waters, uh, all the way up to big national campaigns. So, I've had my fingers in uh, the effort to protect Bristol Bay for a long time, and yeah, happy to be here, and really excited to learn more about our work in Massachusetts. That is one thing I haven't heard, I haven't, I don't know too much about. So, looking forward to hearing that piece of the story. Awesome. Thanks, Nellie. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Megan Barker. Uh, I'm the Bristol Bay organizer for Trout Unlimited. Uh, I also live and work on traditional Dene'ina homelands, um, otherwise known as Anchorage, Alaska. And I've been with TU in this capacity for almost three years, which is um, really exciting and um, something I'm very grateful for. Uh, I've specifically worked on Bristol Bay um, during my um, my time with TU, and I've met a lot of people um, through the campaign working um, both in Alaska and the lower 48 to um, share what's going on um, when it comes to the proposed pebble mine and now as we look forward for permanent protections for um, Bristol Bay. Uh, I also um, am really excited to learn about um, some of the tactics that have been used in different campaigns in different places where Trout Unlimited works. And um, it's fun to see some of those differences across the country. So really excited to be here and um, excited to virtually meet and engage um, lots more of our supporters here. Great. And uh, I'm Jeff Yates. I'm the Director of Volunteer Operations. Um, I'm just thrilled uh, to have so many people interested in, in this topic and learning more about advocacy. Um, I've been a TU member since I was 11 and uh, a volunteer since I graduated college and have been on staff for uh, eight years now. Um, and one of the things I've I've seen and believe so so fervently in with TU is just the power of our, our, our grassroots community and those connections we have um, within our community that that really make us so strong um, as people who care for and, and can advocate for rivers and streams. So I'm excited to share the Redbrook story because uh, to me, it's emblematic of how we can take um, what we do every day on the on the big national level with TU and, and bring it down to that very hyper local, you know, specific watershed, specific river, um, and how even though the odds may look insurmountable, we can we can win uh, again and again and again. Um, so I, I want to see us do that, um, and uh, and looking forward to it. Well, just to give folks a little bit of an overview, I think before we dive in, kind of what we had planned for um, the first part of the session was just sharing a little bit more about um, both Bristol Bay and Red Brook, and then both um, 
Nellie and Jeff and uh, myself wanted to share some of the specific tactics that we've used um, when it comes to advocacy and what we've done to elevate our campaigns, both within small communities and, and nationally. Um, and then we would uh, um, open, want to open it up and, and like Jeff said, uh, and best advocates as possible for places and, and fish that we care about. So I think Jeff was going to kick it off um, by giving us a little bit, bit of an overview about Redbrook and we'll pass it to you. Awesome. Um, can you advance slides? Because I don't know if I can. Um, so what, what, um, yeah, Megan, can you hit the next slide, I guess? Yeah. There we go. Perfect. All right. So this is Redbrook. Um, Redbrook uh, has a, a unique uh, glacial history. Um, it is located, and you'll see on the map later where, where it is, uh, on the edge of Cape Cod. Um, and it is part of a, a glacial moraine. So in, during the last ice, uh, last iciation, last glaciation, iciation is a more fun word anyway. Um, during the last iciation, um, the, uh, the glaciers extended all the way to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And as they retreated the first thousand years or so, they deposited somewhere between 200 and 600 feet of loose till material, the, the boulders and sediment that comes off the front end of a glacier right over uh, the, that Cape Cod area. That provided a, a very um, kind of what you call a nutrient poor sandy soil, but that is very good at uh, transferring water up and down through that, that porous material. Um, and so for Red Brook and for a number of the other streams that are uh, on and near the Cape, as well as also further down the coast in Long Island, you have pretty much a stream that's sitting right on top of an aquifer and the aquifer is perpetually uh, uh, kind of pumping up groundwater. Um, so you have really great spring fed creeks that are flowing um, at sea level. What you also have in many of these streams are sea run brook trout, um, some quite large sea run brook trout. Actually, I meant to put a picture in from, I know Warren Winders and some of the folks were out sampling Red Brook two days ago and, and the, that fish in the bottom right is small compared to the one that they found. Um, and that was uh, really awesome to see. Um, but the, the sad fact is that a lot of these sea run streams are also under, under threat all the time. Um, what makes uh, that, that soil so great for uh, aquifer and water transfer also provides, you know, really great sand and gravel for quarrying. Um, that, that low elevation um, and ease of, of managing, you know, kind of managing the land makes for uh, easy development uh, and things like that. And so we've seen um, other sea run brook trout streams, there's very few of them that far down um, in New England, most of them that are that are still strong and thriving are up in Maine. Um, we've seen a few of them actually blink out um, where the populations has crashed, usually due to overdevelopment, stormwater runoff, um, and incursions of polluted water into those aquifers. So protecting these special places is really important. Trout Unlimited, um, first at the volunteer level and then um, with some national and regional support has been working on, on Red Brook and the other streams, Quashnet, Child's River, um, Mashpee, and some of the others for decades. Um, the local chapters, the Cape Cod chapter and the Southeast Massachusetts chapter have been very active, have kind of been at the forefront of that work, including some of the, the kind of radio telemetry work uh, to track these uh, salters in and out of Buzzards Bay. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've spent the, the, the view you're looking at here, the one downstream, that's the Lyman Reserve. Um, uh, where a big majority of the Red Brook flows right where it meets the ocean. Um, and TU collectively, chapters, councils, um, TU national programs have spent over $4 million uh, on Red Brook and some of the surrounding uh, sea run brook trout streams here. So Megan, if you could go to the next slide. So last night, um, I was going to put a Billy Joel quote here from the Down Easter Alexa, and then I re-listened to the song and realized that he's talking about Gardner's Bay um, off of Montauk and not Buzzard's Bay. And I was like, oh, you all know Buzzard's Bay because of the jo Billy Joel song, and then I would have uh, been absolutely wrong. Um, so to be precise, it's not the, the same bay as, as the Billy Joel song. Um, one of the things that I think um, I, I always find amazing about places like this, I live in Connecticut, so I live fairly close to Red Brook, but is how much 
uh, natural resource we have sometimes in such close proximity to millions and millions of people. And I just wanted to show you where Redbrook was uh, in comparison to Boston, uh, Providence, Rhode Island um, on the map, and then show you that Lyman Reserve. And, and basically, uh, Redbrook is that green area in and around the Blue Star Highway. It's uh, the border between Wareham um, and, uh, gosh, I'm going to blank on the next town over. Um, but that green space is pretty much the entire kind of aquifer watershed for Redbrook. Go ahead, next slide. And uh, along came several years ago, a development company out of Boston called Nodos um, that wanted to put in a racetrack and casino. Um, and you can see they magnanimously included some nice open space uh, in the middle of their de planned development um, to protect, uh, that's also Pine Barrens, uh, one of the, the three last remaining uh, uh, coastal Pine Barrens. Uh, the, the Pine Barrens here in New Jersey and in Long Island are the last three. Um, Kind of th that habitat type um, and uh, but to build this development what they had to do was they had to get the whole aquifer protection zone that's that's there and um, some of the residential and other kind of zoning changed they needed to have the town of wareham rezone uh, that that area and so that was really what the fight was about it wasn't about the specific development in fact they withdrew that specific development um, uh, proposal from the town uh, a couple of years before, and and then you know the town uh, elected officials were moving forward with a rezoning proposal that would allow development in the aquifer. And of course, everyone was dancing around the fact that it was development that uh, was really designed to meet the needs of this person. I do want you to notice um, in the left hand side, you'll see a big solar array field. Uh, there you'll also see in the upper left uh, some of the sand and gravel quarries um, signs of other types of uh, developmental activity that's going on we'll talk about those a little later on um, but the casino and racetrack uh, on scale would have been significantly larger than those other impacts go ahead next slide and so this is a, a map one of the things that um, we thought about early on as this uh, rezoning effort uh, came about. Um, the first thing was it was we, we weren't aware of it. It was the local volunteers who reached out to us, uh, the Massachusetts Rhode Island Council, the Southeast Mass chapter, uh, the Cape Cod chapter, um, because they'd started hearing about this and they needed they needed help. They wanted information. They wanted guidance. They were already meeting. They invited uh, myself and Keith Curley uh, to join their meetings. Um, and one of the things we quickly realized was just talking about sea run brook trout was not going to sway uh, this issue. You can see the red area. That's the, the proposed rezoning. And you can see it's actually right on top of one of the biggest aquifers in, in that town. Um, and in fact, very close to where most of the public drinking water supply comes from uh, for that town and surrounding communities. Again, it's right on top of the aquifer. They can they can pump, you know, clean uh, drinking water supplies. And so the volunteers had already made inroads with a, a number of other organizations in the community um, that were alarmed and concerned about this rezoning proposal. And we realized that there were certain things that Trout Unlimited could bring to the table, um, really passionate members and supporters, um, a knowledge of, of, of the fisheries and things of that nature. Um, and in a case like this, uh, the mapping ability of, of TU National Science Department to really provide a good infographic to show people what was at risk um, if this rezoning went forward. Um, but at the end of the day, what we knew was that the argument wasn't going to come down to fish versus people, fish versus the economy. Um, it was going to need to come down to um, a broader array of, of, of publicly valued kind of needs and resources, you know, drinking water supply, natural resources, the pine barrens. Um, and that's where that kind of that the beginnings of those that campaign was built and um, and where we went from there. So next slide. I think it's that's mine, right? Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. That's a great overview. Um, and really excited to dig into kind of some of the the success of things that TU and and others did. Um, Nelly, if you wouldn't mind um, giving us a little bit of overview on Bristol Bay, <laughs> kind of set the stage there for us. Sure. Um, thanks, Jeff. That was great. Um, very excited to learn more. Uh, 
I will give you guys a, my my surface level overview of Bristol Bay. I, I think that that many of you are probably familiar with the basics, but Bristol Bay and there is a giant truck going by my house, so hopefully you can't hear that. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, Bristol Bay is in the southwest corner of Alaska. So if you're looking at a map, um, you have Anchorage kind of in, it's not backwards, it's in the center. You have Southeast Alaska down the Panhandle, and then you have the Aleutian Chain and Bristol Bay is in that bay. That's that bay right above the Aleutian Chain. And there's these giant river systems that feed into Bristol Bay and it produces about half the world's sockeye salmon. So if you eat salmon in a restaurant or, or order it um, in the lower 48, it's a good chance that it came from Bristol Bay. Um, it, is, it is one of the last places in the, the entire world where wild salmon thrive. Um, they come back by the tens and tens of millions. Um, last year, they broke a record with over 65 million fish and they, that was a record set just a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, if any place in the world was built to, to produce salmon, it's, it's this river system uh, in Southwest Alaska. Um, and those salmon support um, just a, a, a suite of really important um, of things. Um, first and foremost, you know, there's a, uh, the indigenous communities uh, of Bristol Bay have lived there for time immemorial and uh, have a, a culture and a life that is really based um, around salmon and the land and their strong connection to it. Uh, they still very, are very, salmon are still a very active part of daily life and culture. Um, uh, and then you have a commercial fishing industry where all the salmon that we eat around the country, uh, you know, is, is brought to your tables via the commercial fishing industry. That's a, a, a more than a billion dollar industry every year. And then it's a world-class sport fishing destination. You know, it's, it's known as the, the, one of the first fly out um, fishing regions in Alaska. Um, ten, uh, thousands of anglers uh, go there to fish every, every year. It's a, it's a bucket destination. It's a destination you either dream of going or uh, hope to return um, where you can not only catch all five species of salmon, but uh, rainbow trout as big as your leg. Um, and just incredible place. Uh, a lot of people think that you can drive to Bristol Bay, but you can't. Um, it's about, um, an hour and a half flight from Anchorage. Uh, there aren't many roads, if any, well, there's a few roads, but they're not, they're not connected. Um, you know, really it's just this, this one of the last places uh, in the world where you can experience um, endlessly winding rivers and wildlife and fish as they've been for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, it's a special place. Uh, and in the early 2000s, um, a, we local people uh, started hearing rumors of a giant deposit of gold and copper that would have been essentially underneath the two, the headwaters of the two big rivers that feed into Bristol Bay, the Quijac and the Nushagak. And uh, the more we learned about um, this deposit that became, came to be known as the Pebble Deposit, uh, the more concerns grew. Um, it was massive, you know, it was starting to be touted as uh, one of the largest deposits of gold and copper in the world. Um, it was very low quality um, ore deposit, which means you'd have to take out a lot of material to extract a small amount of, of material. So, you know, we're talking about almost 11 billion tons of, of material that would have to be mined uh, in order to get the valuable minerals out. Uh, because the area had uh, no roads, no infrastructure, you know, it would not, the, it, we're not only talking about the mine itself, but a pipeline and several new ports and a hundred, hundred mile plus road and um, just a whole bunch of, of, um, of infrastructure to support the project itself. Um, so, you know, as as we learned more, and and this is you know, in the early days, um, you know, I think the, the the pebble fight really started with local community members hearing about this project. Initially, a lot of people thought, 
oh, this could be good. This could be a source of jobs. But the more we learn, the more they learn, the more they grew concerned. And, and I think really um, started to educate and learn more about what hard rock mining is and what it, what it can do um, to especially clean water and fish. And that um, started gaining momentum. And 20 years later, you know, the, the, the issue has um, gone from only a few people knowing about this massive mine um, in a remote part of Alaska to million, a million, more than a million people knowing about the proposed pebble mine and the risks that it poses to a world-class fishery. Um, and the local communities and businesses that that depend on it. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, a couple of of things that stand out in my mind is how, without um, the the vocal leadership and learning and um, digging in and paying attention to this project early on by by local local people. Um, you know, I don't think we would be at a place we are today. Uh, I also, um, you know, so so this program grew or this pro this campaign grew from very very local to to regional to statewide and to national, and that that was um, a huge part of the success um, of of getting from a proposed mine that was you know moving forward really with lightning speed to a place where we've been able to put on the brakes significantly and are now able to be looking at, at long-term protections for the region so we never have to deal with the pebble mine again. So um, Megan, did I miss anything? That was kind of all over the place. We can dig in. No, yeah. that was great. That was great, Nellie. Um, one thing that I might add um, just to, again, highlight the importance and the role of um, local leaders is uh, we, Nellie, um, last year right after um, the key federal permit for Pebble was denied, had the opportunity to sit down with a lot of these leaders virtually and, and talk to them about their experience. And those conversations have been recorded and shared on the um, Trout Unlimited Digital Magazine. Those stories were first shared yesterday uh, and we'll be promoting them and, and sharing them on social a little bit more um, in the coming weeks. So highly encourage you to head over there and hear firsthand from some of our um, indigenous leaders, as well as um, business owners and other folks who've been in this fight from the beginning. Um, so Nellie, that would be the only thing I would would add there. I think uh, also a lot of people have been following following this issue for 20 years, um, but also we have a lot of new people who, who joined our effort um, in the last few years when things really ramped up specifically around the permit um, that was being reviewed by the Army Corps of Engineers and that was ultimately denied um, last year on the grounds that it didn't meet clean water standards and uh, clean water act standards and that it was contrary to public interest. So that for a lot of people was was a place where they could get involved and, and join the effort. And I think now is a, is a great time to talk about some of the specific organizing and advocacy tactics that we took to, to get us there. Um, and there are so many, um, as people who have uh, engaged with these campaigns, and I'm sure um, Jeff, Jeff will be speaking on um, Redbrook in, in a moment, but there's a lot that goes into making sure that people know what's going on um, in their fisheries if they are not engaged, um, you know, firsthand. And so um, for us, you know, how did we start from local and take it, take it um, to a much larger campaign? Um, one of those tactics uh, absolutely for, for Bristol Bay was the sticker, um, which always, always comes back to um, what people identify us as. And I think a, a critical part of this is, is a big part of branding and making sure that the message, a really clear, a really simple message um, is, is kind of like almost like a badge of honor that people wear to, to show where they stand and um, show where they, um, yeah, support, support in this issue. And Nellie, I don't, I know how like thousands of stickers have gone out just in my couple of years of working on this issue and working for TU. Do you have any like number guesses of how many no pebble stickers have been distributed over the years? Uh, it's, I wish, I wish we would have started counting in the, in the early days, but, um, you know, uh, Bob Gillum, who is a very, uh, 
he has since passed, but he was a really big player in the Alaska world early on in this campaign. And I think he he sent hundreds of thousands of stickers out into the world and out into the state. Um, great metric that I wish we would have tracked from the beginning, but hundreds of thousands. And yeah. it's really fun to get those stickers from all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. That was what I was just going to say is some of my favorite anecdotes that I hear from supporters or when they travel abroad and they're like, how was that? a bar in Dublin and I saw it on, on the wall or something like that, or I was traveling, um, you know, on a road trip and I saw it plastered on a road sign. Uh, I think that's such a great example of how far um, this campaign goes and how far this effort um, has been, has been reached just through something as simple as no pebble mine with the red X through it. So having a sticker, I think was a really, and it continues to be a really important part of our work uh, as a, as a, communication tool and also just bringing people together and creating community um, through a, a shared image of, of what this fight means. Um, so sticker, I think, was a huge part of, and, and like I said, is part of our, our effort. Uh, another big tactic that I know has been in, incredibly important, um, both on a small scale and then also on a, a larger national scale is the role that that industry and the sport fishing and hunting um, uh, uh, industry has played for us. So as Nelly said, this, this effort started small um, and, and local. So it was the local businesses, the lodge owners, the guides, and the outfitters um, who were boots on the ground um, living and working in Bristol Bay, um, who were outspoken and helped raise this as an issue of uh, both local and, and national importance and kind of how that progressed and what we saw in especially the most recent years um, with the with the permit um, being under review was that the entire uh, or a huge component of the, the national industry um, stood up and, and spoke out for Bristol Bay. And just one way that I think the industry um, was was really utilized well was being able to bring all those voices and all of the different um, people from that that are included as clients, as customers, as supporters together being able to leverage that power. So uh, one example for, for Bristol Bay of using that industry power was having a letter from over 250 sport fishing and hunting um, businesses um, that was signed to the president of the United States last year asking for the permit to be denied. That was a huge um, place where we brought both local and national groups together to just show exactly the kind of, of power and, and um, different voices that were outspoken. Um, for conserving a really special place. Uh, and so again, I think that the power that industry has to play for these campaigns, whether they're they're local or they're national, can absolutely be leveraged to help us elevate um, the issues that we care about. Um, we have had incredible, incredible business partners, and we're so grateful for uh, the emails that have been sent, the social media um, presence that they have that have given us. Um, the financial generosity that that so many um, uh, businesses have have lended our campaign. Um, all of it is is to say that we couldn't do this without partnership with um, the outdoor industry and um, the power behind that was just um, really incredible to see and we're really grateful for the partnerships um, that we that we leverage there. And then the one of the last tactics I'll just share um, that has helped us be really successful when it comes to, um, Bristol Bay was just really having a strong online presence and a strong digital presence. Uh, as, you know, this was something that we were doing a, quite a bit of before COVID, but especially after COVID when we could no longer engage with supporters at sports shows and doing events in person, um, creating and having a really strong digital community online um, made it really easy and effective to communicate with supporters no matter where they were in the country and, and to direct them towards um, opportunities for, for action. And this is just one example of, of a time when having a really strong digital community was, was really helpful. So uh, right again in the spring before the, the permit decision was made for the proposed Pebble Mine, um, we launched a couple of different social media days of action. Again, we, we pulled in uh, lots of our chapters, lots of our um, industry supporters to in one day of, of um, having a huge microphone sharing that we were asking the president to deny the, the permit. And um, you'll see that there are like 12,000, almost 13,000 likes on this post, which exceeded our, our normal reach um, by 
so much. Uh, and it was actually considered like a day of um, going viral for us just because of how many new people we were able to reach. And I think uh, those no the numbers are a little bit um, fuzzy to me now, but in less than 24 hours, we had about 20,000 um, si new signatures onto a petition that we ended up using to, to help um, try and get this permit ultimately denied. So again, just ha making sure that we're using our tools, particularly our social media tools to um, bring our community together in a way that uh, organizes folks towards action. So those are just a couple of the, the big tactics that I think really characterized the Bristol Bay effort. Nellie, did I miss any that maybe came from before my time? No, I think you ca captured some good tactics. I think the thing I would add, and you know, Jeff, I think you touched on it a little bit as maybe a, a, a similarity to the Red Brook is, you know, folks from different backgrounds and different industries coming together, united against a project or for for a project um, is really powerful. Um, I think one of the things early on that made people pay attention um, to the Bristol Bay and Pebble Mine situation is that you had local people, commercial fishermen and sport anglers all coming together to say no to a project and say, this is this is not what we want and we are united against that. And, um, you know, I think back then and today that that does get people's attention and and um you know we we kept that in mind early on and i think you know even through today of how important that kind of united front is in in communicating to decision makers um you know the, the media and the the pr pieces of, of campaign work so that's one thing i'd add thanks nelly uh, Jeff, I'm going to kick it over to you to kind of share some of the tactics that uh, you and the folks with Red Brook um, used for your effort. Great. Can you all hear me all right? All right. Um, so in, generally speaking, um, we learned a lot from watching uh, the Pebble Mine fight. Uh, we were also handed a gift. The developer that wanted to develop a, the casino was called Nodos. So their name made for a perfect symbol of the fight even though they would pulled their development back everyone knew and our goal was to tie the rezoning proposal to that developer um but we had to also think about some of the other strategies and tactics um and and i'll step back one 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 level the the pebble mine fight was a national international conglomerate you know fight right it it, it had to cross every single political and geographical border in in the country um, this rezoning fight for Wareham was a town board. There are 15,500 registered voters in Wareham. And you, you need to get one third of the votes who attend a public meeting to say no in order to win, right? They have to get two thirds majority um, in order to pass an initiative like this, a rezoning the way they were running it through their ballot. And we knew that they typically got about 14% voter turnout. So we knew that we had to hit 30% of whatever the turnout was. If we could get 31% of the vote to be no, we could block this. So our size was smaller. The other thing we knew was part of our strategy for, for winning was to really paint this as out of town Boston developers trying to tell people in Wareham what to do with their land, right? Um, to tell the Wampanoag, uh, you know, to tell the, 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 the folks who have been working forever on the Lyman Preserve, to tell the, the, the community members, right, that this is what we was best for them. So we had to be very careful because we only have two members in that town. So we were wealthy out of town public interests, um, mostly from the greater Boston or the wealthier Cape Cod communities coming in to tell these community folks what to do with their land. You know what was best for them what was beneficial for them, so we had to be very careful that we would not you know actually take on that same mantle. Um, in this fight that we needed to be rooted in and with the, the grassroots community the local the local advocates and activists who were working on this and that did it range from the, the you know the indigenous community through. Uh, local garden clubs and watershed associations land trusts and things of that nature. 
So that was something that was really, really important to do. But the, the nice thing going into this, I think, and this is where uh, for me as the director of volunteer operations, I really like to focus on when I, I talk to, to volunteers within TU, is the lift was not that hard. It seemed big, right? We have this massive developer out of Boston who's willing to spend millions and millions of dollars to, to, to push through a rezoning to you know, build their casino. How can we ever beat them? And, and, and the simple fact was we, we just we needed 1400 people if they got such a massive turnout at their town meeting right that we get to get 31%. So all of a sudden you can realize it's not as big a fight and then the tactics are exactly the same right. Uh, we used a lot of digital, this was also during COVID. so um, we, we used email the one of the first things we did was sent out an email to the trout unlimited members now we worked on messaging with our partners. Um, and to make sure we were aligned on message, but we also knew that our audience was mostly interested in brook trout, sea run brook trout, and so that was the subject line. Um, you know, we stood up one of the digital fundraising pages using the new TU, new TU tool, and you'll see just asking Massachusetts members and supporters and friends and family, and I know Chris did a blog about it and, and pushed it out nationally, we raised $15,000 uh, for, for this advocacy fight. Um, Lots of social media sharing and amplifying news stories um, about the issue uh, when partners like Jeff Day from the Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition was interviewed by Fly Lords, another great partner of Trout Week, right? Um, we were able to amplify that. Go ahead, next, uh, next slide. But probably I think, uh, oh, yeah, and then that, that's right, I totally forgot about the, um, and, and then we, we worked with our partners to do two weekends of in-person picketing. Um, at socially distanced masked, masked intervals in front of post office and town halls um, and making sure that people knew that the vote was coming and they saw lots of peers and friends and neighbors um, who were saying, you know, we, we need to turn out. Turning out is the most important. And of course, your, your, your dog would vote no. So um, go ahead. Next, uh, next slide. But here's where I think it, it, it really it really helped us uh, over the top. We had that great emblematic stop pebble, no to no dose uh, sign, and we were able to put out you know, that one unifying symbol with a few different messages. Don't rezone Red Brook's future. Yeah. We're protect our water supply and wildlife, right? Nothing about fish on it other than our logo. Um, Wareham's public health water supply sorry, public water supply health risk by rezoning with that map showing how much of the, the aquifer and would be would be impacted, right? So trying to message the, the ads to the community that we needed to turn out and vote. Go on, next slide. And I think, um, and uh, oh, the last one, we stand together in opposition, showing all the partners. It's very similar to the, the you know, the Stop Pebble, all the businesses, showing all the partners that were, were part of this. One of the things that I thought, um, was was really interesting on this. Um, we we spent about seventy five hundred dollars on advertising. Um, both TU National, uh, Keith Curley and Steve uh, Moyer helped kick in, as well as uh, the Massachusetts Council from the funds that were raised. Um, and despite the fact that this developer was sophisticated and had lots of attorneys on staff and had been planning this rezoning effort forever, I don't think they anticipated how fervently the pushback would be. We actually bought every single available ad spot for the six weeks leading up to the town vote so everything that was left besides the you know the local football ads and the local supermarket ads we and our partners bought so anytime there was an, a news article in the local news about the development even if it was a pro editorial about the development our ad would be on top saying vote no um you know or next to it in the sidebar and so that was something that I think you could not, if you were a voter in Wareham for, for that six week period, you could not avoid the fact that there was an important vote coming up on April 12th and everybody wanted you to vote no. Um, and to me, right, it's, it's funny because, you know, we, we called this how to kill a giant. And at the end of the day, we ended up being the giant in some ways um, because we had the ground game, we had the people and we had we had all, all, all the kind of the, the media we needed um, behind it. So on uh, next slide. I think that's, yeah. So I, I will say this, um, all along the volunteers, the partners, we didn't think we were gonna win. 
Um, we thought that from everything we could hear, you know, the town, the town was uh, elected officials were in favor of this, you know, development, money, economy, uh, lower tax mill rate for their, their residents, things of that nature. Um, and it sure seemed like they were doing everything they could uh, to depress votes, to ensure that, ensure that people wouldn't come out. So for instance, this was a pandemic and this really important vote that was very clear leading in the weeks leading up had a lot of public interest. They scheduled it and because it, so they knew the turnout was gonna be high, they scheduled it for outdoors on April 10th in a field. And I put the weather up for the day because I thought that was interesting. The, the meeting was at 2 p.m. The high that day was 49 degrees. And there was a consistent 20 mile an hour wind with gusts up above 30. We had, you know, there were over almost a thousand people. There are actually more than a thousand people because some of them weren't registered voters lined up. It took them two hours to check everybody in um, in order to vote. And at the end of the day, um, we won 813 to 141. Um, I mean, just not just like a win, but like a massive. We didn't get our 31 percent. We got, you know, an eight to one vote. Um, what I will say is this, along with the, the campaign to turn out this vote, to turn out these wonderful people who care so much about their community, um, we were already having discussions about what steps we could take um, to file uh, uh, against the way this was handled in the public, what steps we might need to take to, um, to you know, halt this. We actually have had those discussions. Should we file to, to pause this, this vote? Should we should we be ready to, to file an injunction? Who should be the aggrieved party? Would it be the Wampanoag? Would it be uh, one of the land trusts whose lands were going to be impacted by this rezoning? Should it be a neighbor uh, to the development? Um, so all those kind of strategic legal discussions were happening. But what we knew was if we really focused on the on that ground game on getting the voters out, um, we had a really good shot at winning and, 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 and we did. Um, and, and we did because we had so many people in and, and around that community um, pushing for it. I think I've got one more slide, right? So it's kind of the what's next. So now we have this coalition. It's the Community Land and Water Coalition. It's the three towns. It involves so many different partners. Um, and what we've learned and, and, and what, um, what we need to continue working on uh, together um, are, are so many other threats. Above, you'll see that's a part of Pine Barrens being clear cut for, to build solar uh, arrays. Um, and that actually requires some state regulation changes, um, unfortunately. But um, actually in the picture on the lower left, the, the man in the middle with his back turned, probably on the man on the left too, but the man in the middle, that's uh, Warren Winders uh, from the Southeast chapter, who's kind of been working on Red Brook for more than my lifetime. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's one of the people who has given his, his life to these Salter Brookies. And it's so great to see um, TU being part of that with this whole community of, of partners, this coalition that's building um, all around Red Brook, all around Plymouth and Wareham and, and, and for us, the Salters, but more importantly, the Pine Barrens and, and these rivers. So. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. Um... Um, at least, no, I don't know as you were listening, but so much was going off in my head of like, oh, that happened to us too in Bristol Bay or like some of those key moments of, yeah, wondering about process when things seem stacked against us and, uh, you know, when are we going to use those legal tools to come out for these really important places? I think um, we were definitely in positions in the last couple of years where we've asked those things um, and, and even beyond that too. Um, Nelly, anything stand out to you and um, you want to mind, or would you mind giving us kind of a recap of where we stand now for Bristol Bay? Sure. Yeah. I'm going to say hi to my mom real quick because I'm a doctor. <laughs> hi, mom. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I think one thing that just is continually inspiring and is a, is a piece of the, the Red Brook fight and, and certainly has just shown up time and time again in the Bristol Bay fight is, is, the, the the local community and and Alaskans and the nation, but but particularly in local communities where you know there's a public hearing, it's scheduled for four hours, it goes for six, and people fill the gym, or the community center, or the 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 tribal center to and stand for hours and hours and hours, 
uh, to make sure their voice is heard on a project. And, you know, I think sometimes you wonder as a citizen, like, does that matter? Does your, does your voice matter? Is it worth spending your time standing in line or waiting for your turn to, to speak up? And, and it absolutely does. And, um, you know, it, we've heard it from, from the folks on the other side of the microphone at those hearings where they're, they're listening to community members and, and how, how much that input um, does, does influence decisions. And, um, you know, I think it matters from a community standpoint, like when you see your community um, coming together around an issue that so many people care about, it, it's inspiring to, in that moment, but also inspiring to, to, to people who, who see it in action. So, um, you know, I, I, there's, there are so many stories and, and Megan, you were really smart to flag. Um, some of my favorite moments of, of my job have been doing interviews with um, several community leaders that I've, I've met over the years and, and they're on the, um, the T blog. I'm sure Megan and Jeff have the link handy. Um, but, but some of the stories um, from the early days of the pebble fight of going by dog sled with a projector um, uh, to village to village to tell people about the risks of mining. Um, um, you know, hearing the very compelling um, just stories from elders uh, who have um, been in Bristol Bay for since before electricity and, and um, you know, just how much the land and the salmon mean to, you, to them. So I guess uh, that's a long way of saying that, you know, the underlying theme in all of this is like people's voices really matter and we have to keep standing up and speaking up, even when it's a 10 year or 20 year process. Um, and I guess that leads me to, to the next. Um, we have definitely celebrated the, the monumental milestone last year of uh, permit denial uh, for, for, Brist for Pebble Mine. Um, that gives us a lot of breathing room um, to say, okay, like that was loud and vocal and nobody wants pebble, but we also need to get long-term protections in place so that we never have to deal with the pebble mine again. So that, that my kids and our kids are not dealing with pebble mine 20 years from now. So that Alana Hurley, who I interviewed and who's the director of United Tribes of Bristol Bay. So her kids don't have to, to fight this mine when, when they're older. Um, so, so now is the time where momentum is on our side. We've said a resounding no to, to Pebble, but now we need to make sure that long-term protections are in Bristol Bay so that we can put our energy to, to good things, right? About uh, keeping the fishery thriving and um, ensuring fish jobs are, are going to local kids and you know all sorts of really good stuff that you know the energy that was put towards defending against a mine can be you know keeping Bristol Bay the prosperous and fish filled place that it is. So um, we have a couple things on our radar uh, right now is one, TU um, pursued a lawsuit um, or, or, or sued the EPA against a decision that they made in 2019 to withdraw uh, proposed protections for Bristol Bay. Um, we were successful in that lawsuit and um, the EPA has committed to reinstating those proposed pr protections. So we will have a process over the next year, maybe maybe longer, um, to make sure that, that that important layer of protection through the EPA and the Clean Water Act, Act is put back in place uh, and finalized. Um, and then, you know, um, ultimately, Congress and the Alaska State Legislature will play a really key role in making sure that we never have to deal with pebble mine again. And that is something that we are taking a really close look at and um, and hope we can we can work on in the coming years too. So um, stay tuned. Megan is is our guru on uh, keeping you all up to date and making sure that uh, when we do ask you to do something that it is the most impactful and um, you know what what we need at that moment and uh, yeah, Megan, Megan, you've done a great job at, at keeping folks informed and engaged. So thanks. 
Thanks, Nelly. And thanks, Jeff, also for giving us a, a look into the future of, of where things stand and, and what's coming down. I Before we go into to questions, um, and Jeff, I'll turn it over to you to kind of uh, facilitate some of our, our open um, chat. I just really want to hone in again on, I think, some of the, the biggest underlying theme that we've talked about um, in the last 50 minutes or so, which is just the importance of showing up. And I want to be clear that from my position as an organizer that showing up can look so different for um, so many different people. And not, not everyone is gonna be in a um, situation or in a place where um, showing up to testify is either you know, the best use of their skills or, or relevant to the issue at hand. Um, not everyone's gonna be marching in a, in a um, protest against um, you know, the, the development issue that's coming down the line. And I just want to be um, really clear that no matter how you engage, whether it's um, writing an op-ed or donating your photographs um, to a local organization to help um, spread the word in a media campaign, um, calling your elected officials, making, making that a, a daily or weekly practice, all of those things are, uh, I think, by definition, showing up and showing up for these special places. And um, chapters, um, your councils are a really great place to um, kind of ha have the right pathway for doing that and being effective there. Again, um, it's our job to, to help make it as easy as possible for you to engage. And so if you have questions, I know that to you staff, I feel like I can blanket say that to you staff are always game to help you find a, a good way to plug in based on your skills and where you're at. So. Um, with that, I, I think that's a, probably a good place to kind of turn it over and open it up to this group. And um, Jeff, I'll let you, I think you're the guru behind the, the Zoom setup to maybe take people off mute or answer questions. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks so much. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. It's uh, there's actually a lot of people I can see on this call who I, I know have been involved in, in different, you know, advocacy battles at different different levels. So um it's it, it's exciting to see uh, the one thing i would reiterate um that, that megan said showing up looks different for in so many ways and, and it can be lots of different small acts um we're here to help uh your volunteer operations staff the tu staff we have a great group of organizer staff across the country that 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 meet regularly um that we can connect you with if you have a local campaign that falls within a watershed they're working on um and we also have kind of tools and and resources to, to help you um, lead advocacy in your chapter or council. Um, I think for me, the, the biggest thing um, that I had to personally get over as a hurdle for, uh, as a volunteer um, in my local chapter um, was feeling like I wasn't prepared enough or I didn't know enough to go go speak um, at a public hearing. And, and so we wanna get everybody, if they want to speak over that hurdle, if they want to write a letter, or sign a petition over that hurdle. If they want to uh, support advocacy in a, in a different way, to, to help you find find ways past kind of the barriers that that make you a little hesitant to do so, um, and to empower you to to lead others. Go ahead, Megan. And I was just going to add one um, shameless plug. I'm actually doing a session with United Women on the Fly um, next week on the fourth, I believe, um, and we're going to be digging into all of that. So how to actually call your elected official, how to write an email that's going to be effective. So Th those sessions are open to anyone, again, United Women on the Fly, and we'll be going through some of that to try and help reduce some of those barriers. Because it is, it can be intimidating. It definitely is, um, seems a little bit um, daunting when you step into it, but um, we're here to help. Absolutely. Okay. Any questions? Um, you know, even like where you can catch a 14-inch brookie on Redbrook. Um, the answer is park and walk to the bridge and fish right, right under the bridge, but... Um, What, um, let me ask the two of you, are, are there, are there other big mines on the horizon, either in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest that, that we're hearing rumblings about? <laughs> um, <laughs> there, are, there are, uh, I mean, Alaska is still a, a very active mining state, so there are, um, mines in various, um, stages of development. Um, you know, I think the one that the T, the ones that T was also kind of tracking most closely are a series of 
very large scale mines in British Columbia that are on salmon rivers that flow into Southeast Alaska and, um, you know, have the very real, um, uh, real the, the reality of, of probably having a massive impact on salmon runs and the communities downstream carry a whole bunch of risk and not a whole lot of rewards for those mines. So we're tracking those um, kind of the transboundary mining area uh, is what it what, you know if you want to do a little more research there's a lot of info out there can we help with salmon surveys in bristol bay <laughs> that would be a dream job i think i'd like to get out behind my uh, i want that job <laughs> <laughs> um you, you know i I know ADF and G hires hires biologists pretty regularly, and uh, it's always been a fun thought to do some uh, citizen citizen data collection. We just haven't haven't put that together yet. How do uh, they actually? How do they? How do they count millions of salmon? How do they estimate it? What what tools do they use? I've always wondered that when they're like, "Wow, there's seventy million, and it's like, <laughs> I, who who is there? A guy who's really fast at counting who sits there all day, you know? Yeah, it's a combination of, of some sonar work that technology is evolving and getting better, but then they have counting towers. And yeah, it would be, an, I think, exhausting. One of my uh, friends had that as her one of her summer gigs in college, and she just would sit in the tower all day. And it was way up high to look down on the river, partly to see, but also partly because there are bears everywhere. And she just had a clicker and would just count fish all day long. So get a job like that, that'd be fun. <laughs> Paul raises an interesting point about um, the influences of, of wealth and, and, and money and, and uh, on kind of some of this advocacy work. Um, one of the things I, I've, I think, come to, to recognize and, and learn more about as I, as, I, as I start digging more and more into kind of my own little personal equity journey is, is just being aware of how much inequity there is um, and that so much of the work that we do is really environmental justice work and needs to be and that needs to be rooted in that um you know is is there any you know can you speak to that a little bit as well um megan or nelly sure i can i can start yeah i would just say that um you know we might come into some of these issues with our our specific fishing lens, but as you pull back those layers, it's so clear that all of this is connected between, um, yeah, economics, um, social structures, uh, you know, the, the list goes on. And I think at least when it comes to Bristol Bay, it, it's really important to kind of put that in context with what we, what we bring to the table as far as Trout Unlimited. So, you know, TU can, has a really awesome uh, sport fish community that that is strong and um, very vocal and that um, has come out for the region, but also so much of this is realizing that Bristol Bay, first and foremost, is is a place where um, people have lived for for many, many years and especially in Bristol Bay like being off the road system it's really expensive to get goods and services out there like groceries and so sockeye salmon yeah we like to fish for them but also um and if not more importantly it's 50 percent of the the protein source for um local people in the region who would have to pay a lot of money to also um you know have food flown in um or or shipped in so, so like i said when you pull back some of those layers and you really dive deeper into um these places and and what they mean to people outside of our own community it's really incredible to just to see um, you know, how, how different people come to one place. So that'd be what I have to say about that. Nelly, what else do you have? Yeah, I think that's, that's right on Megan. You know, I've, I feel like I've learned a lot and I'm still really learning about, um, you know, how, uh, the intersection between, you know, our work as a fisheries conservation organization and our work as really um, allies on, you know, ensuring local communities and indigenous communities in particular up here are, are heard and um, you know their their values and their culture is really valued and vocalized and um, 
taken into consideration and, and first and foremost taken into consideration on these decisions. So, you know, initially I think I came into this from a, 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 a fish, a very fish focused lens, but, you know, as you get to know people and, you know, you can't do this work without, you know, really becoming friends and talk, having a lot of hard conversations about all the various layers. And then you, you know, now I don't do this just for the fish, right? Like I do this because generations of people have depended on the land and the water for a long time. And um, I want, I want them to continue to be able to, to do that. Um, yes, I love, I, you know, I love fishing and fishing out there, but it's not, it's not about that really. <laughs> but I am so glad that people care, you know, know enough and care about it to, to speak up because that's where they're coming from, but a whole new layer. No, it is. It absolutely is. And I think, um, that's been the, the the coolest part for me and when, when I've watched other chapters get involved in advocacy and really start start digging in is, is finding just out just that intersectionality of, of all those things so I'm good all right well it's it's been an hour um, if, if there's no more questions um, and Doug please tell Carl on Facebook although if he's still li listening hi Carl um, give me a shout uh, give Jeff Wright a shout um, you know we're here to help um, and uh, but uh, I thank everybody for joining and um, if you have any other questions don't hesitate to reach out to myself to Nellie to Megan to, to anybody on 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 to you staff. Um, if we don't have the answer we'll connect you to the person who does um, and uh, thanks for tuning in for this trout week uh, event and uh, we hope to see you at so many more um, and you know on into the future. So, Megan Nellie thanks for thanks for joining us and uh, giving up your, your lunch break. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate everyone thanks. who joined. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Have a great Bye. day. You Bye. too. Bye now.